This is the Compass Podcast. We're seeking the divine in the everyday. My name is Ryan Dunn. I'm saying hi on behalf of co-host Pierce Drake, who we'll hear from later. You know, part of recognizing divine presence is seeing the holy spark in other people, which, let's admit, can be really tough at times, can't it? Especially when those other people hold different worldviews than us, or maybe they're of a different political persuasion, or they're dismissive of what we believe. We can be honest, we've all run into situations where we've made a well-reasoned, common sense case for something in which we believe only to have our point of view completely dismissed by someone else. What's going on there? Why don't they get it? And when someone is so resistant to reason, how do we, you know, follow through on a Christian call to love that person like we love ourselves? Brian McLaren is a really well-known and prolific author. His book, A New Kind of Christian, is a pivotal piece for a lot of today's Christian leaders. He also wrote The Secret Message of Jesus, which was personally eye-opening for me in relating the words of Jesus to 21st century circumstances. Another book, Naked Spirituality, offers simple, doable, and durable practices to help people deepen their life with God. One of his perhaps lesser known books is a little one called Why Don't They Get It? It's a little less about faith than many of his other books, and is more about communication. Specifically, it's about how we communicate important and sometimes conflictual ideas. In this short book, Brian addresses 13 biases that are present in everybody, even me and you, and gives practical insight on how these biases keep us and others from hearing new information. In identifying the biases, Brian offers some insight on communicating with people with whom we disagree. And it's no coincidence that we reached out to Brian to talk right now, just a few weeks before an election in the U.S. and at a time when we seemingly have so much polarization where people are saying, I know you disagree with me, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. So what do we do? Do we throw our arms out in the air and say, forget it? Or do we find some more effective ways to communicate? That's what Pierce and I talked with Brian McLaren about. It was such an amazing conversation. One that's gonna stick with me for a while. I think it will stick with you as well. And it's next on the Compass Podcast. Well, Brian McLaren, thank you so much for joining us. Brian, how goes it with your soul today? You know, I am, uh, I'm feeling strong and I'm feeling motivated and I'm feeling inspired. uh, And um, I feel like so much is at stake in our world today. And I'm, uh, yeah, I'm uh, fired up and ready to go. How do you, how do you take that with everything going on for the listener, for ourselves, for myself, you know, um, taking everything that's going on, what are some habits or daily rituals or, or rhythms of life that you have found help you be able to answer that question that way in a season like today? Well, I'm sure there's some days I couldn't answer it quite that For sure. Well. For sure. Days yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm just worn out and exhausted, but, um, you know, I've been at this a long time. And so that's a, a really good question. Um, Uh, You know, in my very early spiritual life, I uh, developed some basic disciplines like journaling and prayer and uh, Bible reading and so on uh, that set a foundation that has served me well in the years to come. And and I guess one way to describe that is to say that the the thing that I think exhausts us and and wears us out is when we live by reactivity. In other words, where things happen and we are in such a reactive mode, our our reactions then get us in trouble. And then now we have to react to our reactions and react to the reactions of others who are reacting to our reactions. And, you know, there's just no rest from that. So to me, that was uh, something that really happened literally 30 and 40 years ago of setting that kind of basis. But nowadays I'd say if there's one discipline or practice that helps me, it's just making sure that I rest. Uh, I heard someone years ago say rest before you're tired. 
Um, right. and, and I like that idea from, you know, the Jewish calendar where you think the day begins when you go to sleep. So instead right. of resting to recover from today's uh, craziness, I try to go to sleep tonight to prepare myself for tomorrow's. And uh, that idea of, of not of, of not overdoing it and not living out of reactivity. Yeah, I'd say that's what helps. That's beautiful. Mm. Indeed. Well, the season that we're in where I think so many people are tired out merely from like the discord that we feel from one person to the next, you know, the, yeah. the polarization that we hear about, uh, that all affects us. You've spoken quite a bit in how we uh, maybe begin to like bridge the gap a little bit yeah. or at least come to uh, like a sense of, of peace with with the gap being there if that's yeah. fair um and y- you've you've tabled this in or couched this in conversations around biases that that people hold um not just biases that other people hold <laughs> it's important to note that we ourselves have have some biases like how did you come uh into this well what's your story of of discovery of like uncovering your own biases like brian mcclear and person with biases how'd you come across that well here's a terrible thing for me like anyone else we're usually the last to know about our own biases right (laughs) other people can see them better than we can but i was a pastor for 24 years and you know and before that i was a college english teacher so and and since then i've been a writer so i'm a professional communicator among other things you might say and um a few years ago watching the political discourse happening in our country watching Uh, people become meaner than I've ever seen them be in my entire life. Watching norms be shattered, watching all all these things happen. I, I got nervous and I have two friends who are uh, psychologists, you know, PhD or uh, psychologists. And I contacted um, them and I said, look, if you see anything that can help me understand what's going on in our country right now, will you send it to me? Only send me, you know, stuff that you think is scientifically credible and so on. And um, so I just started immersing myself in social psychology and trying to understand what's going on. And one thing led to another. And I realized that there was this field um, about authoritarianism and about, uh, about how certain kinds of authoritarian leaders tell people what they want to hear in order to, and by you, by doing so, the leader manipulates the people to do what he wants them to do. Right. Um, and, and they're happy to be manipulated because they're hearing what they want to hear. Well, that opened me up into all this uh, study of bias. And, um, and I started with one and then it was up to three and it was up to seven. And I think now I've got a list of 13 biases that ha- are, are just helping me understand every headline I read, every wow. political speech I see, even, you know, yeah, just an awful lot that happens. And then once you know what these things are, uh, it's a little bit like, you know, COVID-19, you find that, oh, loss of smell and loss of taste are symptoms. Well, you start to realize, what are the symptoms that I'm playing into uh, biases in the glitches in the way my own brain works? Yeah, so often that is, that's really easy to point out in other people. Yeah. <laughs> it seems to be, it, especially if you're on Twitter for more than five minutes, um, you can see yeah. it pointed out. But so, so many of us, um, we don't want to do that work on our own, not, yeah. not toward ourselves. Uh, that exposes our own stuff um, and exposes that the way we think isn't the right way we think. I meet with a, uh, a pastor who's a retired pastor. He's, late seventies, early eighties. And, uh, I take him to lunch once a month and he long story short grew up in, um, was born in America, but his parents were from Germany and they went back to Germany from the, for a death of a relative. And while they were there, um, kind of the country shut down and wow. he was, he was in back in the forties and thirties and or thirties. And he was a tall young man uh, with a straight back and blonde hair and blue eyes. And as an American got put in Hitler's youth, Wow. And, and uh, because his parents were, were from Germany. And, uh, and so he's been somebody that I've, I sit down and ask questions a lot, yes. a lot of this kind of stuff and just learn from. And one of the things he asked me the other day, and I love this phrase, I never heard it. He said, have you researched your thinking? Yes. yes. Have you researched your thinking? 
And, um, and so for somebody listening to this, that just for a, maybe a moment is going, how do I, how do I do that? How do I, how do I look at my own self and understand my biases or an, another way of putting it? How do I research my thinking? Yes. What are ways that they can take steps in that? Well, first of all, that's a great phrase, research your thinking. Um, uh, uh, let, let me just give a quick example. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I am someone who has become convinced over many years that the environmental crisis is, is an existential threat. And that it, it's not just climate change, although that's so serious, but what we're doing to the soil, what we're doing to our oceans, what we're doing, there's this mass insect die-off, mass reptile die-off, mass mammal die-off. I mean, w- w- what we're doing to the earth is not sustainable. And I have grandchildren. I, I mean, I, I, I care about them. So I'm really convinced about this, right? Um, the other day, uh, I uh, was you know, in YouTube and um, and a YouTube thing came up about about uh, about the environment, about solar panels. I just invested, you know, a big chunk of money to get solar panels in my house last year, and it was about the ecological uh, damage done by solar panels, and how there's not a plan to deal with this. Well, I've got to tell you, everything in me wanted to not watch it. Right. Um, I started it. I thought this is, and something in my brain said, this is telling me something I don't want to hear. Right. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and I, I got to see, oh, that's how bias works. I just invested money. There's something I call cash bias. It has to do with being invested in something uh, financially. Um, I, 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 and I just, there's something I call complexity bias. I want a simple answer. And now to tell me that my simple answer of solar panels actually has some, com- some complexity to it, right? Uh, I, f- I found all my biases kicking up. Mm. And, and here's the problem, though. Probably 99.9% of people don't even know that they have biases. Right. Um, they, haven't, they haven't ever, unless they have a deep contemplative practice, they just assume that their reactions are to be truth. believed. Yeah. The truth, exactly. So one of the biggest things is, is to learn to separate my thoughts from myself, to separate my reactions from myself. This is why I love that there's a verse in the New Testament in the book of James that says, let everyone be slow to anger, mm. slow to speak, quick to listen. And so this sense that, don't just live by your re- your reactivity. Uh, that to me is the is the key to see something happens and it makes me angry, or something happens and it makes me happy. Well, maybe I should interrogate the reasons uh, behind that. Yeah, yeah, research my own thinking, study my own thinking. Yeah, yeah. You know, you mentioned contemplative practice there, Brian. Uh, what? is a contemplative practice that you employ that helps you kind of turn your, well, maybe your critical eye inward where you are yeah. able to kind of identify the, the biases most likely at work in yourself. You know, there's a saying in 12 step recovery, I, I, um, you're only as sick as your reactivity. Mm-hmm. And in some ways, I think a, a core of the contemplative practice is cutting the line of reactivity. So what happens, you know, when you begin to learn, for example, uh, centering prayer, you you sit quietly and your thoughts come by. And what you do is a thought comes by and, you know, I'm sitting here. I want to be quiet for a few minutes. I think it's Monday. Oh, Monday. That's trash day. Oh, the trash. I forgot to take my trash cans out. Right. And -hmm. and then I better go get get them. Right. So uh, that's just reactivity. But I stop and I say, oh, I'm taking some time for contemplation. Isn't it interesting? I became all agitated about my trash cans. Let's let that go. So then I just return to, to a restful contemplative state. And then I hear a truck go by and I think, oh, I wonder if the mail truck has come yet. And then, oh, there's another thought. Well, the act of noticing your thoughts rather than being immersed in them and then being able to let them go, that's one of the skills of contemplative practice. And and what studying bias has done for me is it's helped me become maybe a little more uh, sensitive to the kinds of thoughts that kidnap me and that I need to be able to say, hold it, I don't want to go on a reactivity uh, cycle with this thing. Let's see what's going on. As you do that, 
embracing that kind of moment where you want to push it back and you embrace the moment a little more. Um, what's the, I'm trying to figure out how to even ask the question. What's the way that you decide, okay, I've embraced this long enough. Yeah. <laughs> I'm done embracing it and I actually need to turn it off um, or I need to go to something else. Um, what's the, what's the, what's the thing in you that goes, okay, it's time to kick it. For well, this moment. The, the, the thing I would say first is that we have to realize that a lot of people have spent zero minutes of their lives ever trying to notice a difference between who they are and what they think. They, their opinions are them, right? And, right? and so the first thing I would say is until people learn how to make that distinction, they're not going to be able to do anything. Um, uh, they're just going to be, well, how, what is that phrase in, in the New Testament? They'll be uh, cast here and there by every wind, <laughs> uh, every opinion that comes along. They'll react to it, agree with it. And, and a lot of us call this dualistic or binary thinking. You're either for it or against it. Everything is for it or against it. And so whenever I'm in that mode, for, against, for, against, I, I can... I become suspicious right now. Mm. I'm just living in that kind of binary mode. Um, uh, but I'll tell you the other thing that helps me with this. It's to realize that my thinking doesn't just happen inside my head. My thinking is connected by my ears and my eyes to what I'm reading, what I'm hearing, what I'm watching on television, what I'm seeing on my Twitter feed. And every one of those interactions is an attempt very often uh, by somebody to sell me something, get right. me to vote for something, get me right. to support something, get me to not support something. And when I realize that I am under an onslaught of attempts to manipulate or direct or push me in one direction or another, that gives me added motivation to say, yeah. if I'm getting sucked into something, I'm losing my self-control. I'm losing my freedom. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm becoming somebody's puppet on a string. Wow. Wow. Going back to that video that you came across on Facebook, that the anti-solar power video, no doubt there were uh, some compelling arguments made uh, within that video. That, yeah. In the same way that, you know, those of us who believe that uh, there are human factors at play in like creating global warming, uh, look at the evidence that we see and are convinced that uh, that something is going yes. on here, and we yeah. can we can give out these arguments to other people, very well reasoned arguments, uh, yes. certainly passionate arguments, uh, the the evidence that has convinced us, and as we hand that over to them, like they still don't get it. What are some of the factors that yeah. play in them? you know, still rejecting what it is that we have to say that seems so clear to us. Sure. Well, let me, um, could I just mention a, a couple of different kind of biases that are at, at play in situations like that? Yes, please. Um, and, and I should say, you know, I, one of the, well, one of the very first things I did when I was watching this video is I did a little research on the guy giving the video. Right. Um, and he actually believes that climate change is real. In fact, it's because he's so concerned about it that he is made this video. And his point isn't don't get solar panels. His point is don't think getting solar panels is going to solve all of our problems. We've got even deeper problems and we've got to go to those deeper levels. And, and, and w which was great, but the, the most basic bias is, uh, is called confirmation bias. And this has been proven by psychologists, social psychologists in a hundred different ways, but confirmation bias basically is this, what I currently think, is what I want to keep thinking. And if an yeah. idea comes that reinforces or confirms what I already think, I welcome it. it it's like a magnet. It gets, you know, it, it accepted by my brain. But if it, if it contradicts what I already think uh, or disturbs what I already think, my brain has ways of saying, oh, that's stupid. Oh, that's idiotic. Oh, that's this, you know, whatever. We put a label on it. We find some way faster than we consciously are aware. Confirmation right. bias is really really basic. Another is complexity bias. We like things to be simple. And so uh, uh, if something comes along that just feels to us, that's more complicated than what I currently think, then our brain has a way of filtering it out. The way I say it is our brains prefer a simple lie to a complex truth. 
Um, so, wow, that's really good. Uh, so that's another one. Another one is community bias. It is very difficult to believe something that my community doesn't believe. And so here's the thing. What we don't realize is, uh, you know, there's a, a, a news channel out there that people often people listen to as if it's a religious broadcasting network, right? And they listen to it day and night. And it creates a sense of we're a group of people who see things in a certain way. Right. And, um, uh, and so they're part now of that community. And they become aware that if they were to change their mind on any of the issues that that community agrees on, that they would be mocked and ridiculed and hated by those people who they listen to every day. That your brain is so afraid of being rejected by its community. Right. Put those together. And you realize, yeah, there are reasons why uh, when you give people straight logic, their brain shortcuts the logic, short, short circuits, any thought patterns that would open them up to that data. Yeah. I remember when you were talking about confirmation bias and like hearing something that you disagree with and then shoving it aside automatically, and, <clears throat> excuse me, downplaying it, calling it stupid, whatever. I, I began to think about, um, a few situations and then you confirm that with the community bias to where like before we've gotten to a place where before we even hear the thought that may be confirming or not confirming of our position we make judgments based on who that community is giving us that information and so we don't even get down to the truth of it or the the, the, the falsehood of it it's you know so all these biases they're not like and obviously maybe this is common sense. It's just something good to think about is the, the biases don't play one at a time. They're playing, yes. they're, they're playing together in this like harmony of biases that they're stacked on top of each other. And so as I reject something, it's more than just one or I embrace something. It's more than just one biases. Um, tell me this, tell me what are we, what's something that we're losing out on because of the biases? Well, what, what ends up happening is uh, we, we cluster with people who share our biases. And that makes us automatically reject anyone who has truth that we don't already have. So if I can be very blunt about it, it means that we stay stupid and we stay stupid with other stupid people mm -hmm. and we reinforce one another's stupidity. Wow. Uh, Jesus called this blind leaders of the blind. Um, and, and this is a problem that all human beings face. Um, and and one, it's one of the reasons why in literature, as well as in scripture, so often it's an unexpected stranger who enters into your life, who by you showing hospitality to that stranger, by you being kind, or by that stranger being kind to you, somebody now has entered your world with a fresh idea. And because of some kindness or some connection, um, now you're, it makes it v much, much harder to accept, uh, to reject what they're saying or reject their, uh, their perspective. Um, uh, in fact, if I could just give uh, a, quick, uh, a quick example of this. Um, uh, another one of the biases is called complementarity bias. It, it means, it, it says that if you are mean to me, then I will not believe what you say to me. If you are nice to me, I would like to believe what you say to me, right? Well, guess what happens when we line everybody up in the two parties, you know, or uh, different religions or denominations, you know, I'm Christian, you're Muslim, you know, whatever, I'm liberal, you're conservative. We have all these ways of dividing people. Then what it means is that we're mean to each other and any truth that people on the other side have their meanness makes me not being will be willing to accept it. And guess what? The meanness on my side makes others not be willing to accept it. And yeah. this is one of the reasons why the ability to be kind and gracious to people who don't understand you is a phenomenal gift. And, uh, you know, all of this changes so much the way, uh, if I could go back to the, when I first began being a preacher, I would have had a whole different approach to communication if I'd understood how deeply people are held in the grip of bias. Wow. Wow. How did, 
Oh, go, for, go for it, Ryan. Well, I was just going to ask, so what are some of the ways that you might be different? How would you communicate um, your truth differently today than you did back whenever sure. that was? Sure, sure. Well, um, f- first of all, I would have to decide, I, I, I'd be clear in my mind, am I trying to help people who already share my confirmation bias or am I trying to help people who don't already share it? Because the ways that you communicate the ways that you preach to the choir, people who already agree with you are very different. And, yeah. But here's where it gets tricky. Sometimes the ways that you get amens from the people who agree with you guarantee that you'll drive away anybody who doesn't. Right. right? So one of the things I would say is it becomes extremely important to never dehumanize the other, never misrepresent the other, uh, to always treat the other with great uh, with great kindness and compassion. Of course, this is, you know, deeply, deeply uh, uh, just smart for, for communication as well as being moral and Christ-like. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, uh, but I, I would say there are times where you have to surprise the other. Sometimes people will only be shocked out of, uh, uh, out of their confirmation bias. Someone they respect speaks a tough truth to them. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what it takes to wake them up out of this deep slumber of only hearing what they always want to hear. Yeah, I think there's, there's, a, there's a few things happening there that come to mind. One is self-awareness yeah. of, of your own self, obviously knowing your biases, but, but, but you're speaking from a communication standpoint, who are you speaking to and what's the purpose of that conversation? Yeah. Whether it be a one-on-one conversation or more of a public speaking role, whether it be preaching or giving a yes. message or TED talk or whatever it is. Um, and so I remember listening to one of my favorite pastors who's out in LA. Um, and, uh, and he said he, he showed up to an event to preach and, and the person picked him up from the airport and they were on the way over and, and, uh, the person driving him kind of the host for that, for that conference said, man, they are going to, they love you. They are going to shout you down and say amen to you the whole time. (laughs) And the pastor goes, so, so what you're saying is if I say things they agree with, they'll shut me down. And he, they're like, yeah, of course. And they were like, well, that's not really why I'm here. And uh, so we've talked a lot about the, the biases of others and ourselves and, 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 and having conversations between uh, one party and another party, that kind of stuff. Um, how, do you, how do you go about, um, how do you go about speaking truth to people that, would quote unquote be in your side of the conversation. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, one of the things, it, if I can, let me go back. Thanksgiving is coming up, Brian. Yes. yes. <laughs> and so a lot of family is about to gather around a table together. And um, it's become one of the most divisive tables in the past few years yes. to actually sit around. Yeah. And so um, a lot of us, a lot of us would, 10 years ago said, Hey, we're actually in the same, and I don't like using this terminology, but for the sake of the conversation, we're in the same camp. Yeah. And now it's 2020 and we, we're not in the same camp anymore. Yeah. But, but how do we, how do we speak to those moments? Well, so much to be said about that question. First, uh, I want to say, you know, I used to think, yeah, the, the goal is to make sure that we have a nice Thanksgiving dinner. But now I've come to believe actually if truth matters as much as we say it does, yeah. Wow. Then, then maybe their discomfort at a Thanksgiving dinner isn't the worst thing in the world. Let, let me uh, risk, uh, uh, you know, shocking some people. Right. But we live in a white supremacist country. This country began with white supremacy. It began with white Christian supremacy. It began with white Christian male supremacy. And, um, and what that means is millions of white people had nice Thanksgiving dinners and nobody ever challenged them on the harm they were doing to native peoples right. or to, uh, to black people or brown people. Um, we live in, in an environmentally destructive civilization. Um, and again, maybe, you know, uh, maybe it's dangerous enough that somebody has to be willing to disrupt the peace on Thanksgiving Day. Now, that doesn't, but here's the problem. Very often the way that happens is people get into a fight and fights almost always make people dig in their heels and become more resistant to the other person's idea. 
So how do we get through those kinds of biases? And I'll just tell you one simple little Thanksgiving Day trick I would suggest. When Uncle Harvey says something that you think is racist or bigoted or just plain wrong, um, here's what I recommend you say. I recommend you say, wow, Uncle Harvey, I see that differently. Now, as soon as you say that, Uncle Harvey's going to say, well, what do you mean? And this is where I think your response has to be very strong. You have to say, oh, I don't need to go into it right now, Uncle Harvey. This is Thanksgiving Day, but I want you to know I really see that differently. Yeah. And if you'd ever like to know um, some other time, feel free to ask. And now, if Uncle Harvey really, really presses, then you'd say, Uncle Harvey, I don't want to have an argument with you on Thanksgiving Day. Um, I just want you to know I see it differently. But if you'd like to know the story of how I came to see it differently, I'll be glad to share with you that story. I love that. And now, what we've done is we've given Uncle Harvey and everyone at the table a phenomenal gift. We had the courage to differ because, you know, there's a lot of Uncle Harveys who say stupid or wrong things and everybody just smiles and chokes on their pecan pie uh, while they, you know, listen. Um, we had the courage to differ graciously, but then we made it clear. I love you, Uncle Harvey, and it doesn't change the way I treat you. You don't have to agree with me, even though maybe you think I have to agree with you. <laughs> but then we shift from an argument um, to a story. And very often that story is going to involve, if I used to think the way Uncle Harvey did, instead of telling him how he has to overcome his bias, I get to tell the story of how I overcame my own. Wow. Do you think wow. that that storytelling needs to be like the default of us communicating our differences? Well, it's an important part of it. It's an important part of it, especially in this time. You know, Hannah Arendt, uh, the, the brilliant uh, philosopher who became really a philosopher of authoritarianism at, at looking over world, uh, over world War II and over Nazism and all the rest. Hannah Arendt said the way a, an authoritarian or a dictator or a fascist works is they bombard you with such a blizzard of BS, right? They bombard you with so much, so many lies that you give up on being able to tell which lie, which is a lie and which is truth. And eventually you assume everybody is lying so much that you stop caring about truth and all you care about is who's the cleverest liar. Whoa. Now, I'll tell you, I see that happening in our culture. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and so what I think that means uh, for us is that we have to have a deep reverence for truth. Um, but... A lot of people don't. They've already gone way far down that road of authoritarianism. They've become authoritarian followers who give up on truth and all they care about is winning. Um, and and in, when that happens, sometimes it's only a story they can get through. Let me just give one great example. Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, which is one of the most fantastic bias busting acts of communication in human history. Um, it, the hero of the story is a member of the bad guys. Um, the, uh, the victim of the story is a member of the good guys, right? Everything about that story is brilliantly designed to subvert bias. And I think Jesus obviously gives us a pretty, pretty darn good example. Yeah, that was my next question is how, how is this, you know, this is a podcast where we talk about and have conversations about the supernatural or the, the spiritual in the everyday. Yeah. And so um, through that, you know, how did, how did, how did, how can we learn from Jesus in that? Like, how is it, you know, he, he seems to go in, in every camp that he can be welcomed in and sometimes even not welcomed in. Um, I think sometimes of um, going back to that, the, the reason you're able to answer, and you can please tell me I'm wrong in this, you know, the reason you're able to an answer your uncle the way that is, is there is some relational equity there that you already have built up um, yeah. that you're able to pull from. Like you've put some deposits there throughout the years and that's already playing into it. Um, I think it's interesting talking about truth, you know, that famous line with Jesus and Pilate where Pilate goes, well, well what is truth? Yeah. And he's, he's asking that to the man um, who said, I am, I am the way, the truth, I am the truth. Yes. 
Um, I mean, that yeah. exchange is just worth a whole study in its own because, yeah. you know, because what, what Pilate represents there is power. He says, uh, Jesus says to him, you would have no power if it weren't given to you from above. See, that's authoritarianism. Authoritarianism doesn't care about truth. It only cares about the power to win. Wow. And yeah. whenever you hear people who are obsessed with winning and, they, don't, and they, they violate the truth, that's a sure sign you're dealing with a person on the authoritarian road. They're either an authoritarian leader or an authoritarian follower who subcontracted out, some subcontracted out their own brain, their own thinking to let someone, an authoritarian do their thinking for them. Wow. So Jesus says, uh, he, he says, uh, you know, you have no power. Um, and I'm just here to testify to the truth. What is truth? I think Pilate's question is like a dismissing, you know, what is truth? Yeah. What is truth in comparison to power? Um, but truth is, you know, in fact, truth spoken in love, I think is one of the greatest powers that there ever could be. Um, and this becomes our challenge. How do we speak the truth um, in an attitude of love uh, in the midst of all this, uh, all the danger and craziness and insanity? But what, and, and especially because a lot of us grew up in a context where people seem to care about the truth, but very, very quickly, People have substituted the truth for winning. Yeah. Wow. It's contagious because you get around some people who do it. How, how does, I think uh, Paul quotes uh, the old proverb, bad company corrupts good morals. And if you're around people who don't care about the truth, um, then it's easy for your own norms and standards to start to get lowered. Um, and this is something I think we have to reinforce people uh, with people. We have to say, do you love the truth enough that it, that you are willing to suffer inside your own mind for having to reorganize your thinking if truth comes that d makes you uncomfortable? Um, and I think we have to even just ask people, when was the last time? That you made your that you made yourself uncomfortable by entertaining a truth that contradicted what you already thought, because if some people, if they're honest, they can't come up with an example in the last twenty years. Wow, tw yeah, that was I wasn't thinking twenty, I was thinking like six months. <laughs> yeah, six yeah, a few days. Brian, yeah. Brian went, yeah, a few days, a few weeks, a few months. Brian went listen, twenty years on us. <laughs> listen, there are a lot of people my age who have not changed their mind on anything in 20 wow. or 30 years. And that either means they were perfect and absolute geniuses 20 or 30 years ago, or it means that they stopped listening and they stopped thinking. And they've been living in their little bubble of confirmation bias, you know, for an awful long time. Yeah. Well, speak some hope for us. Is it, it sounds like that one of the reasons why we want to hold on to biases is because it's painful to redirect those ideas. Is it yeah. really as painful as, as we might see from, uh, from the beginning of the journey? Yeah. Well, you know, here's the problem. When you're forced to live with lies, when you're pressured by your community to live with things that you don't actually think are true, or you feel this mounting evidence growing up, the a famous uh, uh, scientist and philosopher of science named Thomas Kuhn called these paradigms. You're, you're part of a, a system of confirmation bias and now evidence starts to arise and it's so much work to keep all that evidence at bay. So there comes a time when dropping your bias, letting your paradigm crumble and welcoming the truth that's trying to get in is such a relief. It's such a joy. It's yeah. such a relief, you know? It just takes the weight of the world off your shoulders. Uh, the truth sets you free. Um, uh, and, and here's the other thing. When you find yourself part of a community that punishes you for asking questions or punishes you for thinking differently, um, that, that pounces on any difference, um, well, you know, you may really value being part of that group, but the time comes where another group welcomes you and they don't put those constraints on you. And now you find another community. And I think that this is what 
the community of Jesus was originally supposed to be about. Now, sadly, a lot of religious communities today are just places of the worst kind of dualistic thinking, the worst kind of bias, the worst kind of, uh, you know, community and confirmation bias, all in this one big, you know, ball of knots, right? Right. Um, But when you come into a spiritual community where you are loved and accepted as you are, it is such a relief. It is so free. When you're in the company of people who love the truth, whatever it may be, oh my goodness, you feel this is what life is supposed to be. Right. Right. Yeah, that's the, to use, to use Ryan's words there. I mean, that's such hopeful language. I talked to a buddy of mine the other day and that, that works with pastors around the world that we would know and, and have listened to and like, and don't like, and all those kind of things. And, and I just asked him, I said, what are, what are the, the leaders and not just pastors, but leaders doing really well right now? What are the, what, what are the ones that, that are doing well? What are they doing? Like what's the common denominator? And they said, they're finding ways in the midst of all of this to have hope be their number one message. Hmm. And, um, and so I'm thinking through myself and, and vulnerability and courage to express this. Like, um, one, it has to do with the fact that my family has grown and I got married and I have a kid now. And so holidays look different for us. Uh, but I quit going home, my home, I quit going home for Thanksgiving five years ago. Yeah. And uh, for a lot of these reasons. And uh, Christmas did not seem to be as political as Thanksgiving was. And, uh, and so re-looking at how to engage that conversation. Um, I definitely know I have enough relationship equity um, to, but I love, I never heard the way you phrased it. I never heard the way you phrased it to say, Hey, I I see, not that I disagree with you. I see that differently than you. Yes. That, that key language line there. And then because actually I'm okay. Not, not having that conversation with you now. Um, And, and working that out. And then I would love to tell you the story. I think it's such a key line for us today. Let me tell you the story on how I ended up in a different spot. Yeah. Uh, because at one point I wasn't. And, yeah. uh, and so and, that's so powerful. You know, this is strong language, but you know, Jesus said, don't throw your pearls before swine. And I think what he meant is if you're in a room full of people who just want to pounce on you, every question is a gotcha question. They're just looking for something to pounce. He's saying it's not smart. It's not safe. They're going to do damage to you. Um, uh, so you, you don't just throw everything out there to them. And, and I think there's also ways that you have to protect yourself where you might say, if you're at Thanksgiving dinner, you, know, you might say, hey, look, Uncle Harvey, um, if you want me to share my story, I've got to tell you, if you interrupt me, I'm not going to continue. Um, if, if you try to correct what I'm saying, if you want to hear my story, you've got to let me finish. And then if you'd like to share your story, you can. But I, I don't want to get an argument with you. Um, I already know what I think. I already know what you think. I, I, I don't think this is a great time or place for an argument. It could be a great time and place for sharing stories. But a story is, uh, you know, is a sacred thing. And you don't attack somebody's story. Um, and, and I think we have to create guidelines and protections for ourselves and for other people. Um, for this. This is why good conversations very often have very clear ground rules. Yeah. Um, I'm in growing numbers of spaces. Uh, uh, my friend Mickey Scott Bay Jones calls them brave spaces where, where we create rules. We, we say uh, one of our rules here is no, no contradiction. Um, uh, I'm sorry, no interruption. And uh, another one of our rules is um, uh, use I language. Don't say you're wrong. Say I see that differently. Um, and, and we just get people, if people refuse, it's a little bit like a presidential debate we saw recently, you know, when people aren't willing to, when people agree to rules and then break them, well, we can just be sure that good conversation isn't going to happen. This is, uh-huh. you, you, we know at that moment, this is not about a quest for truth. This is about a quest for power. And, uh, and when people are trying to overcome you with power, uh, they don't have your best interests in mind. Right. So, uh, and, and they might not even understand it. Um, you know, like, you know, the, the bombastic uncle Harvey, who's always insulting people and fighting with everybody. What we might not know if we could peel 
down the layers, we might, what we might find out is here's an afraid, insecure man who knows that nobody likes him. And he's given up on being liked. And all he wants to do now is at least dominate. Like he, he, he's lost, the, the, he, he's gone so far beyond. This is the only pleasure he gets is to dominate somebody. Well, you know what? Uh, that's, yeah, that, there's, there's, that's not a great, situ- a great situation to have a meaningful conversation. Yeah. Uh, so. That's convicting though, because from that light, we all know a, a quote unquote, a Harvey, you know, yeah. may not be an uncle, but it's, you know, somebody that we've had a conversation with online or uh, yeah. somebody who we have in the workplace that um, it, it pays to kind of reframe that idea of, you know, this is not somebody that is, um, that is purposefully trying to, yeah. to be domineering, but just doesn't know how to be. And we have to be honest that there's a part of uncle, there's a part of uncle Harvey in all of us. Ah, dang exactly it. right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that's where then maybe the most powerful rule of communication, the, the most powerful. This is going to be a great way to end our time. I love it. The most powerful way right here. It's to listen. So then yeah. if we realize, you know what, Uncle Harvey dominates because he doesn't know how to be liked. So maybe what I do is I say, hey, Uncle Harvey, tell me what you were like when you were eight years old. What did you like to do for fun? Hey, Uncle Harvey, tell me about how you, how you and Aunt Helen met. Um, hey, Uncle Harvey, uh, tell me about your first job. Well, suddenly now we've shifted that away and we're letting Uncle Harvey be a person and yeah. we're giving him the most valuable currency in the universe. We're paying him attention <laughs> and we're showing interest in him as a person. Now, here's where things are really interesting. If we want to break through bias, that's complementarity bias. We show genuine curiosity about somebody. And at that moment, they're more likely, they may not be able to, but they're more likely to have something in them say, I'm curious about you too, you mm-hmm. know? Uh, so yeah, listening ends up being super powerful. And in fact, in the midst of, uh, you know, political debates, there's this, uh, some really solid data that says the single best way you can help somebody change their mind is not by arguing with them. It's by listening to them. Well, Brian McLaren, for folks who want to wow. uh, follow up with you and sharing your story and, you know, check out the myriad of things that you're up to, where's a good place to kind of follow you online? Yeah, my, my website is brianmcclaren.net and then you'll find links there to Twitter, Facebook and my podcast and so on. But hopefully people will, uh, yeah, find, find some help there. Well, thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy day and, and, and speaking of good truth and good lessons um, for us to, to, at the core of it, here's what I'm going to sum this up a little bit. At the core of it, you're giving us tools to see the Imago Day and the person across the yes, table from us. Yes, yes. That's the tools you're giving us. So thank you for giving us tools to see Christ in those around us. Thanks also to Reed Gaines for editing the Compass podcast. We'll be back with another episode in two weeks. Be well.